Hello again, rail fans. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, I produced five railroad DVDs on subjects that I was interested in, the last of those in 2010. Now, back in 1998, I went up to the first ever Manchester, Georgia Railroad Days weekend. I was immediately taken in with the CSX Fitzgerald and Lineville subdivisions. Larry Goolsby, one of the founding members of the Atlantic Coast Line and Seaboard Airline Railroads Historical Society, presented a slideshow on the predecessor line A, B, and C that weekend, the Atlanta, Birmingham, and Coast. Well, that sunk the hook with me. I've been fascinated with that territory ever since. Now what follows is my 2010 production of the DVD, The A, B, and C, Fanning the Fitzgerald Subdivision. It's a look into the CSX Fitzgerald Sub as it was in Georgia between 2000 and 2010. Now we're covering just the Fitzgerald Subdivision, Waycross to Manchester, Georgia, during that time from 2000 to 2010. Now if you began rail fanning recently, I think you're gonna like some of the stuff you see in here because a lot of it is not around anymore. This program begins in Waycross and stops at towns and sidings all the way up to Manchester. We wrap up with a short chase of a random train, but with some great Georgia Rail fan friends. So find yourself a comfortable seat for the next 50 minutes and enjoy the way it was, the A, B, and C fanning the Fitzgerald subdivision. Well, it was the A, B, and A at first, and uh, like many roads, it started with uh, a very small railroad, uh, the Waycross Airline, which was a logging railroad out of Waycross. Other buyers came in and uh, used the uh, Waycross Airline as the basis for a line they projected to go from Waycross, which was already a rail center in South Georgia, uh, but served only uh, the East Coast and Florida. They projected it to go into the Northwest, which was uh, untapped territory, a lot of timber there, and had other ambitions to link up perhaps uh, with Atlanta and Birmingham, which were early commercial centers, of course, in Georgia and Alabama. Just sort of a good example of the early railroad fever that was still rampant, uh, even though this was around 1904, 05, it was still at the tail end of the early railroad building fever, and they went into it in a very big way. The southernmost point on the CSX Fitzgerald sub is right here, or was until CSX moved it to cut straight through to the Jessup subdivision in 2007. This is Q127, an intermodal out of Chicago heading to Jacksonville, Florida. 201 miles of this piggyback trip have been over a piece of the CSX with a great history. The Fitzgerald subdivision was the main part of a railroad intended to link Atlanta and Birmingham with Brunswick, Georgia and the Atlantic Ocean. It did just that, but the more important connection was to Florida, and in doing so, this became one of the most important routes on the CSX today. Our story begins here in Waycross, so that's where we're starting our rail fanning trip. 127 is rounding a hairpin curve right into old downtown Waycross. They'll pull in front of the old depot and change crews. Then they'll turn south again on the ex-Savannah, Florida and Western Maine to Folkestone and Jacksonville. In this program, we're scouting the old A, B and C and rail fanning the Fitz, the Fitzgerald subdivision. Henry M. Atkinson had cobbled together his railroad out of short lines and logging roads and chartered it as the Atlanta, Birmingham and Atlantic Railroad in 1905. He immediately set about to re-engineer the Waycross Airline Main to the high-speed standard. Six degree maximum curves and one percent maximum grades. It was very well engineered, especially for the time. Uh, the thought that the builders had was that uh, there were already some rail routes between uh, both Atlanta and Birmingham and the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but they sort of uh, went around uh, by indirect uh, routes. They had stiff grades, sharp curves. And the idea was that uh, if the ABNA could build uh, sort of a super railroad for the time with easy grades, straighter curves, uh, strong bridges, then uh, it could provide uh, a lot of competition for traffic flowing from Birmingham and Atlanta to the, to the sea and take business away from existing railroads and tap into uh, the growing output of steel and iron ore and coal from Birmingham. 
The first major project was smoothing out the hills and hollows north of Waycross at Jamestown. CSX is still running over that very alignment today. You can imagine what these hills were like before Atkinson had them cut down. Grain trains are a staple on the Fitzgerald sub. They serve Georgia's giant poultry industry and provide raw material for bakery products. This is G803 northbound on the double track at Haywood. Spend any time in Georgia and you'll quickly learn that just about every town has a feed mill. Such is the case here at Nichols, Georgia. At one time, the trains of the A, B, and C and the Atlantic Coastline served all these little mills. But that service is almost exclusive to the larger operations now. Coal may not be king on the Fitzgerald, but it's definitely a crown prince. The line sees half a dozen or more coal trains every day. Most serve Florida power plants like this southbound N140, loaded down and headed for Crystal River, Florida. Fitzgerald, Georgia wasn't platted as a railroad town. It began as a development of the Colony Company as a retirement town for Union veterans of the Civil War. Seven streets were named for Union generals. Fitzgerald may be the only town in Georgia with anything named for William Tecumseh Sherman. As a gesture to their Georgia neighbors, some streets were also named for heroes of the Confederacy. Fitzgerald was already a railroad town, though, when ABNA predecessor Waycross Airline got here. The classic Spanish Mission passenger depot was completed in 1910. It now serves as the Fitzgerald City Utilities Office and houses a Civil War museum. Mileposts on the old A, B, and C count up going northward. That's because going toward Atlanta and Birmingham are technically going away from Richmond, and that's how the Atlantic coastline did it. The stamped mileage on the back of the marker roughly indicates our distance from Manchester. Just a mile and a half northwest of the depot is Fitzgerald Yard. Nicknamed Pea Patch, Fitzgerald was once home to the A, B, and C's giant Westwood shops with a nine-bay roundhouse and heavy repair shop. Fitzgerald once employed more than 1,500 workers. Pea Patch is still a sizable crew base. Jobs out of Jacksonville, Birmingham, and Atlanta swap out here. The retired Union and Confederate soldiers in Fitzgerald may have buried the hatchet, but railroad workers were sharpening theirs. 
One of the most tumultuous times on this railroad came in 1921. The ABNA, like many other railroads, had been leased and taken over by the United States Railroad Administration during World War I. The U.S. government paid very good wages, far higher than normal. But when the war ended and the railroad returned to operation by the ABNA, management reverted to pre-war pay scales. Well, you can imagine how that went over. After months of dead-end negotiation, union workers struck the ABNA in March 1921. It was a situation where uh, the, the, the strikers were, were told by the railroad that we, we can't compromise with you, we, we can't uh, keep the wages in place, uh, our way or the highway, basically. And the uh, strikers would not budge either, and even though there were efforts by uh, the National Railroad Labor Board to come in and mediate, uh, that was uh, without any result and um, uh, the railroad uh, set about hiring all new uh, workmen and uh, found, found them. Of course the, the ones out on strike uh, were very upset. All the families uh, connected with them were very upset and the bitterness and divisiveness uh, between those two camps just never really went away. Uh, the strike never was really uh, resolved. It was only uh, called off when uh, the ABNA was uh, made into the Atlanta, Birmingham, and coast by the Atlantic Coastline takeover in 1927. So, uh, for really uh, years and generations after that, uh, people always remembered uh, who was on the striking side and who was on the side of the so called scabs who came in and took over their jobs. And um, families that I've, I've interviewed in recent years still have very uh, clear and often bitter memories of how those times were and, and who did what and whose side, whose side, whose family was on. Moving northwest, the Fitzgerald sub runs through Rebecca, Double Run, and Hatley, rising into the uplands at Cordill. The Fitzgerald sub first reached Cordill in 1902. The Georgia Southern in Florida and the Seaboard Airline were both already here. In October 2001, Conrail 7s were still common on the Fitzgerald sub. Cordial is easily identified in old photos by its water tower on 9th Street. Built around 1900, it withstood the killer tornado of 1936 and served Cordial until 1970. There are five diamonds here. In the foreground is the Seaboard Savannah Montgomery Main Line, now the state-owned heart of Georgia. It rides over the Norfolk Southern's GSNF Macon to Valdosta, Maine on new Owl's flange-bearing diamonds. Train wheels on the lower density line are lifted slightly to keep from hitting the NS rails. This significantly extends the life of the diamond. There were plenty of CSX-7s running as well. On a Friday afternoon in 2001, this local sits in the Cordial Yard with a cut of five-foot wood bound for some pulp mill. In 2010, there are still old soldiers serving the hot trains, but most are getting new uniforms. North of Cordial about a mile, the A, B, and C turns due north. Here, another massive siding, Ross, is most of three miles long. It's a preferred spot for dispatchers to set up meets. Ross is relatively straight, almost unbroken by crossings, and downhill coming south. Intermodal Q121 from Chicago, Illinois, is most of the way home to Jacksonville, Florida. 
the crew on right now will swap out in Fitzgerald. Georgia towns are famous for their familiar names. Please don't call this one Vienna as much as you'd like to. Ten miles north of Cordell, at the ANB 705, we are at Vienna. Q689 is a mixed freight for Waycross. You can see it every day on the Fitzgerald side. Vienna is definitely in the land of cotton, and old times here are not forgotten. Vienna is the home of the Georgia Cotton Museum. Normally, I would not have stopped at a place as small as Lily, but sometimes you catch the trains, and other times the trains catch you. That landed me here in October of 2000. There really isn't much at Lily, there's H.C. Ingram's general store with several layers of Coke signs showing through. My guess is Ingram's once either sold Gulf or Texaco gasoline, judging by the shape of that empty sign mast. There's a grain storage silo across the road, the long-abandoned AB&A depot, and the north end of Lily Siding. Note the doll arm on the signal. The arm indicates that the signal isn't guarding the track it's right next to, but the next one over. These doll arms are quickly vanishing on the old coastline. In 2000, it's only 6,176 feet, but Lily was a favorite of the AK dispatcher on this day, Q214. Empty racks from Tampa to Cincinnati came first. Q214 stopped on the main, just short of the north end signal to let a coal train slide in. When 214 left, up came Q592. Remember, 2000 and 2001 was CSX's A and E period. Anything and everything. CSX had just begun a program to switch the entire Fitzgerald sub to concrete ties, but that would be the end of the expansion. After meeting 214 at Dueling, Q685 popped over the hill. Note the third unit in the consist. Traveling north on Georgia State Road 90, I come across one of those treasured artifacts of the past, an old overpass still showing its Atlantic coastline markings. Those coastline engineers must have known what they were doing because this antique is still supporting 8,000-foot freight trains with three six-axle engines pulling. At Montezuma, the A, B, and C drops into swampy flatlands before crossing the Flint River. CSX moved its main line south of Montezuma's downtown in the 1990s. The old Central of Georgia depot remains next to the Norfolk Southern Fort Valley to America's branch line. The building is now the city's museum. 
The now Fitzgerald sub came to Montezuma as the Atlantic and Birmingham Railroad, but crossed the river and headed north as the Atlanta, Birmingham, and Atlantic. The Flint River defines much of the geography in central Georgia. It was at one time a major artery of commerce in the state. But the railroads that pass above it here and other places change that. This is CSX train Q589 crossing the Flint River into Montezuma. The A, B, and A and the central of Georgia cross the Flint on parallel bridges, but a mile to the north they cross each other at right angles. This is Q214 hitting the diamond at Oglethorpe. In 1905, the ABNA began buying right-of-way to get them out of Oglethorpe and into west-central Georgia. The quest was to build this railroad into Atlanta and Birmingham. Engineering would play a key role in the line's success or failure. It was very well engineered, especially for the time. Uh, the thought that the builders had was that uh, there were already some rail routes between uh, both Atlanta and Birmingham and the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, but they sort of uh, went around uh, by indirect uh, routes. They had stiff grades, sharp curves. And the idea was that uh, if the ABNA could build uh, sort of a super railroad for the time with easy grades, straighter curves, uh, strong bridges, then uh, it could provide uh, a lot of competition for traffic flowing from Birmingham and Atlanta to the, to the sea. There are lots and lots of feed mills in South Georgia, but this one stands out. The giant Tyson Oglethorpe feed mill gets unit grain trains and spots them in their own yard behind the mill. Out of Oglethorpe, the Fitzgerald sub begins to climb into the rolling hills and hollows. The curves become more pronounced as the rails try to avoid the grades. At Ideal, the town's community center is housed in one of the last existing A, B, and A depots. The Highway 90 overpass at Ideal is a perfect vantage for catching northbounds coming around the bend. This is Q544, mixed freight, way cross to Montgomery, Alabama. One of my favorite rail fanning aspects of the Fitzgerald sub is the variety of trains. This is a unit rock train, K710, running empty from Orlando, Florida's Taft Yard back to Junction City Mining. Northward out of Ideal, A, B, and A Chief Engineer Alexander Bonnyman began encountering the hills and ridges that characterize the A, B, and A profile. 
A constant 1% grade runs four miles between Rupert and Mauk. This may have played a role in the CSX's double tracking project in 2001. The whole stretch from Rupert to Mauk is now two track main. The AB&A had struggled to survive for 15 years after the big strike of 1921. It went into receivership, reorganizations, and at one point, directors considered scrapping the line altogether. And uh, finally, the Atlantic Coast Line, which uh, owned routes from Waycross to Florida, and also owned the Louisville and Nashville, which had routes from Birmingham and Atlanta to the north and to the Midwest, saw the ABNA as a link between the, those two parts of its system, bought the railroad out, paid off its debts, uh, changed it to the Atlanta, Birmingham, and Coast, uh, although kept it as a, an independent operation, and so uh, brought it back from the brink. On the US-19 overpass, we catch Q213, Cincinnati to Tampa, auto racks, and empty Tropicana reefers. The engineer is pushing those three EMDs like he's late for supper. Among the most important online customer areas on the A, B, and C was and is near Junction City. Just to the town south is Brown Sand Siding, named not because the sands here are brown, but because the people mining it are named Brown, the Brown Brothers. On 213's markers is A732, a local heading down to work the Brown Brothers sand mines. Three B36-7s on this one. Out of the sandy lands at Junction City, the A, B, and C climbs into hilly Georgia red clay country. This is rural territory, but it seems like everyone wants to get onto the Fitzgerald sub today. At this overpass south of Talbotton, we wait until the track inspector and Bambi are off the tracks for Q685. George's nickname is the Peach State. 
In the heyday, peach packing sheds once dotted the A, B, and C, and even dominated in a few areas. This one, abandoned for a long time, still guards the south approach to Talbotton. When the A, B, and A was building northward through here, it was decided that the old town of Talbotton would be the division point for the line to Atlanta and the one to Birmingham. The folks at Talbotton did not think much of the idea, though, fearing noise and smoke would ruin their town. Plus, they held out for some very high prices on the land needed for a yard. The decision was made to run the A, B, and A right on through Talbotton, but with no division point, settling instead on Manchester for that. Manchester grew, Talbotton did not. In 2001, I stopped in downtown Talbotton for this meet with southbound Q121 and northbound Q-592. Remember, 2001 was the height of CSX's anything and everything power period. We're just north of downtown Talbotton. On July 4th, 1945, up around that bend about a half mile, the southbound Dixie Flagler was approaching Talbotton with train orders to proceed down to Mauk. The operator at Manchester had incorrectly copied the orders, which should have read, meet northbound night passenger train four at Bell, a siding between here and Woodland. The Dixie Flagler had already passed Bell and was up around that curve when the night train got there. The two met head-on at 30 miles per hour, but miraculously no one was killed. The Manchester operator, apparently aware of the catastrophe he had caused, left his post immediately and was never seen or heard from again. In October 2010, the Georgia kudzu is still growing from its summer campaign, but the first frost will soon put an end to it. The three GEs are giving everything they have trying to pull this loaded coal train out of the valley below and into Talbotton. One of the newest sightings on the Fitzgerald sub is Santee, 11,605 feet. Santee is part of CSX's expansion program on this section of its Chicago to Florida corridor. Here is Q237 coming out of Woodland southbound with loaded auto racks for Florida. Today, the dispatcher is holding Q124 in the siding. Unusual that an intermodal train is held for autos, but the grade ahead must have something to do with it. The dispatcher not wanting to stop heavy trains making a run up the hill to Talbotton. In a few minutes, here comes another southbound. Mixed freight with UP power. I didn't get his ID, but I'm betting this was one of the New Orleans reroutes off the Tallahassee sub bound for Waycross.
At the very north end of Santee, just beyond the signals, is Big Lizer Creek. Here's another place that's kind of like Vienna. It looks like laser, but the folks here call it Big Lizer. Making its way toward Manchester, the ABNA was forced to cross Big Lizer, but keep its elevation as it was moving into the foothills of Pine Mountain. That necessitated building a 383-foot-long bridge with a 200-foot deck truss over the water. As the ABNA prepared to ascend Pine Mountain and then drop into Manchester, the route out of Talbotton sent the line through Oak Mountain Gap instead of the Pleasant Hill community four miles to the north. A developer named C.S. Woods quickly bought up land in that area and named his new town Woodland. Soon, Woodland had a cotton gin, warehouse, and several stores. Pleasant Hill faded to just a few houses. Fortunes come and go, and these days Woodland has quieted down to a few buildings and a flashing signal. CSX does maintain a 10,000-foot passing siding here at Woodland, and on a Sunday morning, a rail fan can see a pretty good show here. At the northern end of the Fitzgerald sub is Manchester. Officials of the A, B, and A decided, after the thanks but no thanks they got at Talbotton, picked Manchester for the division point. A, B, and A engineers reached the town by circling Pine Mountain on the way north from Woodland, then dropping down into the valley below. On that same alignment today, a manifest freight is descending the grade into Manchester below, but in run eight because most of his train is still climbing the mountain from woodland behind him. A hopper train soon follows, but does a lot better with two AC-44s hauling empties.
Moving northward and downhill, we're now at the south end of Manchester Yard and a southbound manifest freight emerging from a crew change. Those two trailing Dash 7s would bring out every rail fan in the territory today. But in October 2000, you saw these things every day on the CSX. Even that ex-Union Pacific six-axle Dash 7 wasn't a big deal. And that's why it's not uncommon to run into a rail fan or two at Manchester. It's a popular hot spot. That's Woody Harrison out of Dallas, Georgia. When the A, B, and A selected this place as the junction point for their Atlanta, Birmingham, and Brunswick lines, Manchester quickly grew and has been an authentic railroad town ever since. There were locomotive shops here, as well as car repair shops. The uh, shops that used to be at Manchester and at Fitzgerald have long since been closed and consolidated, of course, but uh, both towns are still crew change points. And even though uh, there's not much uh, switching going on of uh, the freight cars and so on, uh, trains do stop in both locations uh, and change crews. And uh, uh, there's still places uh, where uh, rail fans go and watch trains, take photographs, Manchester in particular because that's where the junction uh, is of the Atlanta Birmingham, and Birmingham lines. There's a nice bridge there to watch trains from. The town's Broad Street overpass above the CSX yard is a favorite photo location since the yard runs east and west here. There are several vantage points right above the action no matter which way it's coming from. Here a southbound grain train comes in off the Atlanta main line, officially called the Manchester Sub. In 1999, the city built one of the first rail fan viewing platforms in the south right here. It's at an excellent location looking out over the yard and the main line junction. From this platform, fans can watch trains coming or going from all three directions. Trains headed for Atlanta make a pretty sharp right turn to avoid climbing another hill head on. The 15 mile per hour track gives fans a nice look at equipment rolling by. On the markers of the Atlanta train, a grain train comes in off the Birmingham side. Remember, this is 2000. CSX was running anything and everything it could find on these trains. You can always tell when a yard or terminal is a crew change point when you see lots of vehicles in the parking lot, but not many folks around. The brick passenger station was constructed by AB&A successor AB&C in 1937. It's the yard office now. After World War II, this building went in to house CTC dispatcher operations. It still contains signaling equipment, but the dispatchers are all in Jacksonville. There's still a local working the Manchester area. This pair of B-36s was switching the yard in October 2001. In this 2001 scene, Q544 departs for Atlanta. 
You can tell this is not a recent shot by that cut of five-foot pulp wood in the consist. That service has long gone from the CSX. On the third weekend of every October, the city of Manchester presents its Railroad Days Festival. A reception is held for retired railroaders and new rail fans at the city auditorium. And there's a big model and collector's train show at the old Callaway textile mill. On a remnant piece of the mill's track, there are handcart rides. And the Goolsby brothers offer motor car rides. Fans gather on the platform to swap stories, count trains, and share photographs. Q592 and there's a Q649 left. The big attraction to Manchester Railroad Days, though, are the CSX trains. You'd never know it was CSX by this consist, though. One year, we saw the CSX office car train on its way home to Jacksonville. This was before the F-40 era. Manchester is unusual because there's only one grade crossing, and that's at the far south end of town. For decades, vehicle traffic has crossed tracks above or below. A concrete viaduct allows drivers to go from downtown right into a residential neighborhood. At the north end of town, a second overpass flies over the yard. The tracks here lead off to Birmingham as the Lineville subdivision. In 1999, the old us and searchlight signals were still protecting the 5th Avenue switch, as they had done for more than 50 years. In October of 2010, the CSX trains are still running strong through Manchester. The YN3 paint is slowly consuming all the variety that was once seen here, but occasionally there is a consist that's interesting enough to warrant a chase to get a second or even third shot. That old Conrail Dash 8 was enough to spark a chase of Q237-14 on this Saturday afternoon. Woody Harrison, known across the south as the real train chaser, Tommy Thornhill out of Cordell and Jonathan Guy out of Chattanooga all load up in hot pursuit of Q237. The first opportunity comes at Woodland where we find Freddie and Brad Frank already there. This father and son team rail fan out of Peachtree City, Georgia on the A, B and C Manchester sub. Leave it to Woody to find the humor in an old whiskey bottle. <laughs> we learned that a meet is set for right here at Woodland. That's why Freddie and Brad were already here. The opposing train is northbound Q142 coming up from Jacksonville. Intermodal and Tropicana loads for Cincinnati. With 142 finally out of the way, 237 eases on down to the switch. The crew apparently knows it's Railroad Day's weekend. And there was one more chance for a third shot of 237. We're beating it south to Talbotton. The manifest freight is still notched up and pulling hard as it comes up out of Pleasant Valley. <laughs> 
Tommy Thornhill creates his own drone shot with his tall self and the roof of that pickup. Sometimes you find stuff you're not even looking for, like what could be the world's muddiest truck at the Talbot and Fire Station. Woody had to get a shot. That's a muddy truck. What it is, see, it's black, rusty black colored under there. And I want it sort of a green, so I'm gonna leave the dirt on. I hope I get some grass growing. That way I just weed eat it occasionally. <laughs> I hope you had fun on this trip. It was a blast making this video. I have to send my thanks out again to Larry Goolsby for his help in showing me around the incredible Fitzgerald subdivision. Write your comments in the comments section down below. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done that. It's youtube.com slash distant signal. Make sure distant signal is all one word, no spaces. If you like this video, please share it with your friends. And let's make plans to meet up again somewhere out there on the high iron. And until that time, this is Danny Harmon, out.